Welcome back to Have You Heard, the social media podcast by us here at The Social Shepherd, where we discuss everything you should know if you work in digital. My name is Zoe. I'm the CEO here. And today I'm joined by Max and Rihanna. Hello. Yeah. Welcome. Do you want to introduce yourselves really quickly? <laughs> yeah, I'm Max, I'm senior paid media exec. Nice. I'm Rihanna and I'm a senior social media exec in the organic team. Nice. You know, um, it makes me giggle every time someone says paid media in their job title because we put it on a TikTok once and people started commenting being like, oh, it's really nice that this person gets paid. <laughs> I remember seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, no, that's yeah. not what it means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they were just trying to be funny or they actually thought that was just why it's called that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, something we'll get onto a little bit later, but I think like if you don't know about the industry, like I remember whenever I was a new, ex well, I was like an entry level. I didn't really know what an account exec was versus mm -hmm. like, you, it's mm. kind of hard to disseminate if you haven't got hands-on experience in the industry. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Well, the, if, is this your first podcast? Have you guys done podcasts before? I no. haven't, no. Okay. First well, time. Well, welcome. <laughs> welcome Debut. Back. We've got some newbies. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Well, we'll skip um, straight into industry updates. And one thing that we have been talking about in the office is um instagram testing unstoppable video ads sorry yeah. unskippable video ads um so what do we think obviously we've got two very different perspectives here rihanna in your role you might have to deal with some of the angry comments that mm -hmm. come off the back of that because yeah. that's gonna I, we might end up getting some more facebook-esque karens on mm -hmm. there if they can't skip their ads 100%. and you're gonna have to deal with the fact that your ads it might have an impact on impressions potentially in certain areas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think initially I think it will cause frustration. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, we see it with YouTube, like people obviously they skip the skip the ads on YouTube. Mm -hmm. They want to skip the ads on YouTube. I think the thing with YouTube and, and Instagram, it's slightly different where with YouTube, you're you're going on for a specific reason. You're going mm -hmm. on to watch that specific video and you know that before you go onto the video. Mm -hmm. Where if, with Instagram, if you're just scrolling, you don't actually know what's going to come next. Yeah, yeah, true. And I guess on YouTube, they have that offer to pay for YouTube premium where you don't have to watch ads. So I wonder yeah. if, like, would you pay for Instagram if there was an Instagram premium? People might. I don't think I would. I quite like watching ads, but then we all work in marketing, so that yeah, probably makes yeah. sense. We're a bit biased. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, oh, that's a good one. I feel like for a user, though, if you're just passively scrolling, that would get really annoying to have an ad come up on your feed. Like you say, with YouTube, you kind of expect that you're going to face an ad and you either wait for it to pass or you're going to skip it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're on Instagram, I think even with people's attention spans these days, like, is that going to cause people to come off app? Like if they're just randomly scrolling, they might go and find another platform that they can just scroll through without having to be faced with these ads i mean it depends how often they're it's popping the up as well because yeah. if it's every now and again you kind of go okay that's an ad that's popped up you won't see one for a while but if it's every three scrolls that would get quite frustrating and max have you seen this when you're setting up campaigns like is it an option to place on an unskippable ad or can, can you flick it on and flick it off because you know you can pick your different placements on youtube for example is it an option or is it just they're testing it with certain ads at the minute yeah i think it's very early stages mm -hmm. in the moment so they're just testing i haven't seen it in platform okay. as an option yet so i think it's very early stages just to sort of see how it performs and see what they get from it and then i think maybe they'll start yeah. introducing it depends how it goes um I think, I mean, it can be useful for maybe bigger brands that want to get a specific message out there if they have like mm -hmm. a launch or something that they want to just get eyes on it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think people don't like change within platforms. Any sort of change people have an issue with mm -hmm. and specifically being forced to see an ad, I think is frustrating for people. Mm -hmm. um, I think people have to get a little bit more dis disruptive is like the wrong word but the ad creative would need to be kind of tweaked for an unskippable ad placement yeah to be mindful that someone's probably going to be mildly irritated within the first two seconds off that ad mm -hmm. and then kind of like making sure that your messaging like you're not really trying to grab attention with that ad you're trying to avoid irritation yeah with that ad does that yeah. make sense mm -hmm. yeah and you need to make sure it's in front of the right people and it's giving the right information for mm -hmm. those specific users definitely 
I would imagine the way that the creative spill will be different as well, because like you say, rather than hooking attention, it's trying to maintain it throughout the whole period of that video. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if there's any information about the frequency of them, because I think it's something like, oh yeah, I mean, Instagram haven't released that much information on it at the minute, it says, but um, I think it's something like one in five posts on Instagram is an ad at the minute or something of that nature. Like it's crazy. Mm. But if we all went and scrolled, we probably would see that. We're just so used to seeing them now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that you could do that with unskippable ads. So obviously no. it is going to be down to the frequency of it because mm. it's just going to annoy people. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it rolls out. But it's, um, and oh, sorry, actually, one other thing I wanted to talk about was comments do we think that it will increase negative sentiment on the platform from a community management perspective i think so particularly because when people are faced with this ad that they've not asked for and they're being forced to watch it there's more time for them before they're able to scroll to think about something that they want to say to pass the time yeah. they might go on and leave a comment because they're frustrated and that's something to do with their time before it moves on again so i definitely think that would pose a bit of an issue in terms of dealing with negative sentiment mm -hmm. um uh so i feel as though that we'd have to come up with ways to try and tackle that in the comments yeah as you a know, response do you know what we should do we should speak to meta and see if we can do some type of test to see like on these specific unskippable ads or any ads that are put into that test mm -hmm. can we measure the sentiment on brand watch and see if there's a difference between the reactions and the comments that we're seeing on that yeah, I think that would definitely be interesting to see because you're always going to get negative comments here and there. Like it's kind of just what comes with social, isn't it? But I do think they would be more frequent on an unskippable ad compared to one that you can mm. just scroll past on your yeah, own board. Yeah, but it's interesting because then would you want to split out the comments that you're getting on the unskippable ad from the rest of your comments on social because mm. there's going to be a negative bias towards them potentially. So yeah. it's how do we kind of manage the fact that brands that do use social listening, for example, to expect to almost see that drop in positive sentiment in certain ways then obviously the real job for marketers is how do we manage not dropping sentiment whilst having these unskippable ads and I think that comes back to the creative 100% alrighty well that's fun we'll see how that works um cool so the next one is Pinterest, sh oh, a report shows Pinterest drives more total attention than other apps. We've been talking a lot about Pinterest this week. And one of the things that I was talking about, mild side note, was is Pinterest actually a social platform or is it a search engine? More mm. of a search engine, I would say. Because you don't really like have well. conversations with people on Pinterest. Like you no. share stuff, but mm. to me, it's like a millennial gen z version of google image search yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a very self-involved platform like you don't go on there to see what other people mm -hmm. are going what other people are doing you go on there with an idea yeah. and to find something that you want inspiration mm -hmm. for um and you i think you do it based on like what's going on in your life at the moment so it is very self-involved yeah, yeah it's not really a it's not really that much of a s scrolling platform although Maria, you said you scroll on, do you scroll on Pinterest or do you scroll, do you search with intent on the platform? You do both. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking I see Pinterest as quite an intentional platform. Like you say, you open it because you want to search something. You're going on holiday, you're looking for outfits. Like, do you know what I mean? Something along those lines. Whereas you might just open Instagram and scroll through the feed and see what the algorithm brings you. As much as Pinterest does that, I think it's more of a place where you're looking for something specific than yeah. a place like Instagram or TikTok where you're bored. So you just open the app and scroll for some entertainment. I think yeah. like the idea of search and social, and we're completely dig digressing at this point, but it's a really interesting topic is like when we talk about PPC or search in general, that tends to be the last touch point or it can't, it's more likely to be the last touch point than advertising on social, for example. But will we start to see, you know, Google is changing so much from a search perspective and they are in a bit of a state of panic because of the search capabilities of platforms like TikTok and Pinterest and even platforms like Reddit as well. So are we going to start seeing marketers shift 
how they kind of measure success and attribute things as these other more social orientated search platforms kind of come to life a little bit more. So like, will we split out how we look at Pinterest, which is traditionally considered a social platform as opposed to search and put that in the search bucket and keep our metas, our Instagrams, our TikToks to some regard in a social bucket? Like, how do we see that kind of happening? Yeah, I do think you need to start definitely looking at that with social platforms i think pinterest especially is one like we use keywords yeah. on pinterest when we're doing that targeting. and we use it to inform our ppc strategy as well sometimes like pinterest is such a good platform to understand where people's attention what they're searching for so yeah yeah 100 percent. and i mm-hmm. think tiktok as well you know especially with like the younger generations i think a lot of people will search on tiktok over google um yeah especially with that younger demographic so i think even tiktok as well Mm -hmm. is one that you could start looking at bringing into that search sort of bracket as well i think because people value having a visual to go with what they're searching as well now whereas google obviously you can have image search and video search but predominantly it's just text and then you go to a website or whatever whereas tiktok for example you're getting a video Mm. tutorial or something to accompany what you're searching for which is actually really useful and i think is valued a lot by Gen Z. Yeah. Is that because so if we think back to social, so uh like our boomer and our older millennials, <laughs> when social first came about, it was text-based. Mm-hmm. So it was Facebook statuses, it was Twitter, it was that kind of thing. So they're very copy-based whenever mm-hmm. they think of advertising and when they expect to be kind of searching for things. And then obviously our younger millennials moving into Gen Z, we've always had more visual platforms. So we've had Instagram kind of really natively we've grown up on that platform even vine for example so is that because of how we're used to consuming media basically like we're just used to seeing things in a more visual way and that's why we defer to other platforms that give us a more visual representation when we're searching for something I think that's it yeah definitely it's just people have been primed to prefer that Mm -hmm. kind of media Um, and that's just how things have changed gradually over time and as you say people are used to seeing more of a visual Mm -hmm. view i think also it it seems more trustworthy i think if you if you've got someone speaking in a video um like ugc sort Mm -hmm. of style videos um and they're reviewing stuff it it seems more trustworthy than when you're on google potentially Mm -hmm. when you're just reading an article or looking at text and stuff it seems more relatable yeah i think that puts more trust for the younger generation when they're searching and stuff. Yeah, nice. All right, well, let's get on to this, uh, the actual report that we're supposed to be discussing. <laughs> yeah. So um, Pinterest has published a new study which underlines the value of aiming for both passive and active attention within your promotions, which can help drive more interest. So people that are kind of not necessarily in market, but might be searching like related key terms and stuff like that. And then people that are actually actively looking for something, I believe that means. Pinterest have said active attention strategies help you to break through because they can't be ignored. They provide that spark of awareness, teaching people about something that they didn't know. Meanwhile, passive attention tools are constant reminders. They reinforce something that's already been learned and keep your brand at top of mind during the broader decision making process. Okay. So that that makes sense. Um, And then based on this research, it shows that Pinterest is highly successful at driving attention. So it's 170% more total attention compared to other platforms. I think that makes sense because you go to Pinterest with intent. Yeah. So you're going to have your attention your attention is going to be there whereas on tiktok or instagram we do just mindlessly scroll so yeah. i always say when people go on tiktok or instagram they instantly become 50 percent dumber <laughs> <laughs> honestly <laughs> no, like your brain cells just like whenever you go on those platforms it's like mind numbing entertainment yeah so like, it's just checking out basically isn't it exactly so it's like i always say like don't put like an overcomplicated hook on a TikTok because yeah. no one's going to understand it. Like you could put the most intelligent person on that platform and they're, yeah, they're not going to yeah. have all their brain cells whilst they're there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I do. I think those stats make sense. And I think in general, when people are scrolling on Pinterest, it's slower as well. Mm-hmm. I think that was in the, the article as well. And yeah, it does draw down to that 
that point of people are going on there and searching and yeah. they have intent already. Um, yeah, because it says here that it's 1.5, they scroll 1.5 times slower past ads. So that's not even just on non-ad content, that's past ads. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And when we're when we're on Pinterest and when we're building ads on Pinterest, we try and make it really native to the platform mm -hmm. as well. It's like to blend in that sort of like lifestyle content. Um, and that obviously helps with to to hit people when they mm -hmm. are scrolling like slower and, and that's that sort of thing. Um, and then on the active versus the passive, mm -hmm. um, again, with creative, when we're looking at sort of like in those active users, it's like that breakthrough content. Yeah. So we go, when we're doing our designs and our creatives on Pinterest, we go, that's where we kind of um, go a bit more out there and like break through into the user. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's more like he heavily edited. We can play around a bit more with the creative when we're on Pinterest as well. That's kind of how we tried to tap into it. Yeah, it's just such an underrated platform sometimes. And like from a paid perspective, we even have some clients particularly in like the homeware space or like mm. furniture space that more like inspiration driven type product that have actually flipped their social strategies for their budget to weigh the heaviest on Pinterest even compared to Meta which traditionally swallows up the large chunk of people's budgets mm -hmm. but yeah we've really seen it it perform and particularly when you're happy you know it does have a longer attribution window and therefore sometimes it can be difficult to see that last click return on it but we have seen that if you invest in pinterest and give it you know 60 to 90 days on a brand awareness perspective then whenever you kind of flip it to that more direct response you can actually see those last click results come through and they can actually surpass meta as yeah. well so yeah i think it it depends with Pinterest on what's important to the client and um, what sort of reporting on in terms of attribution and stuff. Um, but yeah, we've, with some of my clients, heavily invested in Pinterest recently and we've seen good performance from it. Um, and I think, yeah, it's a longer attribution window, but the reason for that is because people are planning on Pinterest. Mm -hmm. They'll go on and they, they'll, they'll see an ad and then they will purchase way further down the mm -hmm. line because they are planning when they're on the Pinterest. But yeah, recently with um, a fashion client, we've seen um, Last Click ROAS really improve. It was a bit of a process of working on that awareness in initially mm -hmm. and then introducing the like full of funnel structure with conversions. We've added shopping campaigns as well. And it's a kind of a long process, but once you get to that point, you do yeah. see the returns further down the line. Yeah, I remember when we were like much smaller as an agency, I think there was like five people in the business and we had... Um, an e-com client and they hadn't done any social advertising outside of uh, meta at that point which wasn't even called meta at that time mm. um and we put them onto pinterest and we were like just please just give it three months like just please let it do its thing for three months and after like 15 days they're like pull it like blah, blah blah and we were like look we can pull it if you want us to but we really would recommend that you leave this on they left it on for the 90 days and they were like it's the best platform. It's help, then it helped them scale their ad spend <laughs> and just be patient. Yeah. Pinterest requires patience at the start. Yeah, I think there's 100%. a lot of value in nurturing that audience though, because on other platforms, it's a lot more impulsive. Mm. Whereas I think if you rely on that, that's quite risky, relying on purely impulse attention and purchases. Whereas on Pinterest, like you say, people are planning. So I think it's important to work on those two. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, nice. Well, we love Pinterest and they send us presents all the time. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, they They're a really lovely team to work with. Um, nice. And then TikTok is testing DM streaks to promote more engagement. So let's get into this one. I'm not as clued up on this update, I must admit, but from a first glance, it's giving Snapchat. Yeah, literally yeah. first thought. <laughs> They're coming for their brand, aren't they? I find this really interesting though, because as much as people use TikTok DMs to send TikToks to each other, obviously. It's not a messaging platform. So to have the whole streaks thing, I don't know. I think that's interesting to to utilize that. Is our streak still something? I don't use Snapchat, to be honest, for like to speak to anyone, although I do mm. like watch the news and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> <It's actually really laughs> good. Breaking news on Snapchat. Yeah, love I love it. it. Um, or like the Snapchat series. Like sometimes oh, I watch yeah. them. I love it. Oh, okay. um, you guys, do you use Snapchat? Mm, not anymore. No, not, no. not really. Like, but I'd say like in the peak 
at school, like it was streaks were everything. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like that was such a huge part of Snapchat. And like, but the thing is, it would be quite superficial because it got to the point where like when that was a big thing, people would be wanting to keep up a streak because you're not actually using the platform, if that makes sense. And so mm. keeping, for those that don't know that are listening to this, mm. explain the concept of keeping up a streak on Snapchat. Well, essentially it's just when you've sent a message to somebody for more than three days in a row, that would then become a streak. And then you have to send a message to them at least once a day to keep up that streak. So for example, like if you've sent one message a day for 25 days in a row, that's a 25 day streak. Do you see what I mean? And can other people see the streak between you and other people or just you and them? I don't think so. Yeah, so no. it's just the silly thing. It's just purely bragging rights, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> the bigger the number, the better. I've seen, like, uh, I saw a TikTok the other day, though, of someone was saying they had something ridiculous, like an 1,000 or so day streak that they had with their friend. Like, obviously, that's years in the making, which is just yeah. crazy. But I don't really know what value that brings <laughs> other than just having a number on your screen but I mean, it's quite sweet in a way it kind of encourages people to keep in contact but i don't think the younger generation are thinking of it like that but no. as you get older obviously and you get busier like people don't keep in contact with yeah, people sure. true. i don't think you're gonna i think you will drop off on that but i think it's quite sweet in a way yeah um but will you Will you take that energy that you used to have at school with your streaks onto TikTok? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was a working professional. <laughs> I can't say I see that happening, to be honest with you. But I don't know. I, I don't know whether this means you have to send video or is it purely just sending a message? Because I think it's just a message. Yeah. So any message that you so send, be a that would count. Yeah. Yeah. So that I find that interesting because then does that mean people are opening the app for the wrong reasons? Because if they say, oh, you know, if you don't want to lose your streak and you open the app and send a message and then you close it again, is that really bringing people to the app? Do you know what I mean? Or I suppose, is that going to, the idea that they're going to then scroll for a few minutes afterwards? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I guess it brings people on initially, doesn't it? It yeah. does. If they're like, oh, I've got to do my streak and then they mm. come on and then they stay on the platform. Yeah. And I think, um, but if it does if it counts like sharing content and stuff mm -hmm. as well, I guess for brands, like if you have that shareable content, that engaging content, then maybe you can tap in there because people might be more inclined on TikTok now to, to share, share content. content. And yeah. I guess that lines up like shares are like the biggest indicator of viral success on both Instagram and on TikTok. So mm -hmm. that makes sense. We're just reading this article and it says that some Snap users have maintained six year long streaks. That's a long that's time. And, and there's, a, <laughs> there's a quote here. So to some, slacking off on a snap streak is seen as a major offense. A broken streak can be so disappointing. In extreme <laughs> cases, it can cause drama and lead to rifts within the friendship. When your favorite app is essentially keeping score of your friendships, it's easy to get caught up. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it sound so dramatic. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does, it does. Um, yeah. I wonder what the record is. The longest the record. streak. Oh, let's Google and yeah. see how long it is. Considering longest... how long Snapchat's been around, there's got to be somebody good who's... A few years, surely. Yeah. Longest Snapchat streak. Do they want a prize or something? No. As of 2024, <laughs> the record for the longest Snapchat streak is held by Hannah and Lauren Lucky. They've maintained their streaks since Snapchat ruled out the feature. 3,046 days. No way. Oh my God. That is insane. That is commitment, that. That, that is play. commitment. I mean, yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, um, I think the interesting part of this is, is as you mentioned, it aligns to TikTok's kind of core demographic. So that younger audience mm -hmm. that they have a mass sort of skew to on the platform, although it is aging up, which is interesting because... Recently, a lot of the updates that we've seen them put out as a platform has been actually trying to age the platform up mm. so that they can tap into those with like maybe slightly more disposable income or something like that. So it's interesting to see them also just kind of like stay true to their roots and think, how do we keep with this younger audience and kind of pull them away from Snapchat onto this other platform? I think it's wild though. Like see, um, like my youngest brother, he only Snapchats his friends. Like that's the only place that he communicates with them. And How I, old is he? He's 22. Okay, yeah. They don't text. They just Snapchat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think like some younger people in the office as well, and I know that they 
Snapchat is like as their core like messaging um platform. So yeah. Mm, anyway. Um well that's fun. Thanks, TikTok, for doing that. Um <laughs> Meta offers money back guarantee for verified subscribers. Okay, so this is interesting. So they obviously um, changed the update last year, maybe two years ago now, where you could pay to get mm. a blue tick, basically. Um, and now they are saying... Okay, Meta hasn't shared any specifics on how Meta Verified is going, which enables users to purchase themselves a blue check mark, which we just talked about. Um, they're now making a bigger push on their subscription offerings, which seemingly suggests that it's having a good level of interest among both regular users and businesses. So money back guarantee, uh, Meta is now offering. So if you're not totally satisfied with the product within 14 days, you'll get a money back guarantee. I'm pretty yeah. sure in the UK, you legally have to give that anyway. That's like the consumer goods Thing yeah, there you is learned about like a school like, yeah. have like a 14 day money back guarantee um but yeah what do we think about that i guess the interesting thing is if you saw an account maybe someone who's an up-and-coming influencer one day they had a blue tick and the next day they didn't have a blue tick because they decided that they wanted their money back guarantee and they didn't want to continue on it would that make you look at that influencer in a different light potentially yeah because I'm sure back in the day, people used to like lose blue ticks for some reasons, didn't they? I think so getting a blue tick away. back then was like a big thing. Like when you got your blue tick and we actually, um, we were speaking to someone the other day who's kind of an up and coming influencer. And he was saying like how, met, how Instagram just gave him his blue tick. Mm. And he was like, but it's not as exciting anymore because you never know if someone's actually been awarded it for the hard work that they've put in and the audience that they've grown or because they've paid for it. It definitely doesn't carry the same value now mm -hmm. as it did back then. Because as you say, if you had a blue tick, that meant that you'd really worked at your account and you were quite a significant figure within that realm. Whereas now, because people are able to buy it, it could just be anyone. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the whole point of a blue tick is that they've, you want to kind of show that they are a particular figure within that Mm -hmm. platform do you know what i mean so now it just doesn't really have the same effect i don't think yeah i mean it de definitely is losing its value yeah. now that people also know that you can pay for it um so i think how would you think about it if like like you for example if you were on instagram rihanna and then you suddenly tomorrow max had a blue tick <laughs> next him, like oh, what would that make you think <laughs> <laughs> i'd probably laugh to be honest <laughs> Yeah, all right. <laughs> Go I just for did it. some really great content yeah. overnight, and then they gave it to me. <laughs> These posts, they just they deserve a blue tick. That's what it is. Yeah, I don't know. That's the funny thing though, because just anyone can buy it. But mm. not calling you just anyone, obviously. Just but anyone. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I think yeah. it's it's not the same as it was. But I think also with that as well is uh, obviously Meta are going to be making a lot of money off this. Um, but are they going to be able to keep those subscriptions? if the blue tick loses its value so i was reading the article and you get the blue tick and you also get some additional like support, support as yeah. well yeah. but it's like is that valuable enough mm -hmm. if the ticks are losing their their value yeah i mean traditionally there's well depends how you look at it we now have a lot of support from the platforms and they're really great but if you're not an agency or not a brand with like a dedicated account manager there and you're just dependent on like live chat, for example, which yeah. I think is the support that you get with this, basically, it's actually not that helpful in mm. some instances. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it is very solely on that blue tick. And then if people aren't engaging with you as much for that reason, for yeah. having that blue tick, then where is the value with it? Do you think some people pay for the blue tick and then lie and say that they just got awarded it? oh yeah oh 100 yeah for sure for yeah sure. i i could definitely see that happening although i don't know this might have been on x but i know they had a feature where you could tap the blue tick and see whether they'd purchased it or it was awarded so whether instagram would have something similar mm. i don't know yeah fair point that would be good i think yeah. because then that's a bit embarrassing if you claim that it's 
been awarded to you and someone can tap it and see that you've bought yeah. it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It wouldn't be so quite the same. Apparently Meta are generating 150 million per quarter from the blue tick element. Wow. So okay. people are buying. Yeah, people yeah. are in there. Um, okay, nice. Well, we'll see how that kind of rolls. Well, it's already rolled out. We'll just see if they make more money from it. Um, okay, our next topic, we kind of talked about this last week with Sam and Scott was about the election. Mm -hmm. And we're not getting into politics. We don't do that on this podcast. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's been more kind of stuff coming out about um, the parties using platforms, particularly TikTok, because it has such a young demographic. And I don't know if they're using it in the most tasteful way either. I'm yeah. not sure if it's quite right. But anyway, um, TikTok are implementing protection measures ahead of the UK election. Um, one of the things I know that you guys talked about in your organic team meeting this week was the use of AI yes. as well. So mm -hmm. do you want to give like a brief summary about what's been kind of going on there? Yeah, so essentially we were talking about how um, obviously, like there are quite a lot of dangers out there with AI in terms of being able to manufacture like a speech, for example, or certain things that are not necessarily true, like people can use AI in quite negative ways. Um, so I think it's quite important that TikTok are bringing in measures that can kind of caveat that and protect users from like false, false information. information. Because as much as I think people are becoming wiser to misinformation on social media platforms, there's still an element of believability when it, especially when it comes to AI and it could be, you know, an edited video of a politician delivering a piece of information that they've not sat there and done. I think it's very easy to fall into that trap of seeing it and believing it because it looks so realistic. Yeah. And I think, um, Someone was saying the other day, actually, in the office that they were on the bus and they were, there was like a group of like kids behind them or like sort of end of school age. So like 18 and upwards. And they were kind of saying like, oh, we'll, we'll just vote for whoever posts the funniest TikToks. And it's like stuff like that <laughs> that is scary. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think this is really good. So so what in TikTok have actually done is they've partnered with Logically Facts, a mm. fact-checking partner to provide media literacy tips alongside key election and voting information from the general from the Electoral Commission. When on TikTok, people will be directed to the General Election Center through prompts and labels on relevant election content when making election-related searches. We took a similar approach during the recent local election in England and Wales and we're pleased to connect hundreds, hundreds of thousands of users to our local election centre. I guess where this gets difficult is TikToks. So this is talking about election related searches, but what about, will they have advanced enough AI to be able to identify when something has used AI to generate content mm. that has incorrect information and be able to put that on there. I yeah. think that's the part that is tricky because yeah. really the people that we're worried about seeing this content isn't people that are actively searching for stuff about the election. It's people that are just consuming it because they're seeing it on their FYP. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it's possible though. I mean, Instagram and X have both rolled out uh, AI generated labels for content that is is using AI. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely possible and they're able to pick it up. I don't see why TikTok is unable to do the same. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, as we said, it is important to do so just so people really understand what's true and what's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a positive thing what they're doing with the, yeah, it is. With the center, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. I think, yeah, hopefully they can pick up a lot of that stuff that's going out to people um, mm -hmm. of, based on like the AI and stuff. As you said, hopefully they can pick that up. I don't mm -hmm. think that always going to get everything so yeah. creating this center is a positive thing i think um and it'll be interesting to see how much of an impact that has overall yeah um because the demographic that are on tiktok are often people that don't vote yeah or like not bothered about well, it or don't understand enough to vote mm. essentially so i do think it'll be interesting to see how much of an impact that does have overall yeah for sure and i think this kind of opens up a can of worms and like the wider conversation about social media because it's like social media gives everyone a voice and the ability to publish content mm -hmm. 
And I think it's great that the platforms take some onus in terms of saying, okay, well, we're going to try and do our best to protect people from other people that might be misusing the platform in these ways. But it's like, is the onus on the individuals using the platform or is it on the platform? Do, do you know yeah. what I mean? Is Are the mm. people, the ones that are creating this content, the people that are kind of in the wrong and should they be responsible for not doing that basically or is it the platform's responsibility it's kind of a tricky i think it should be a balance between bo both ultimately people are going to try and use it to their own advantage and whether that's in the correct way might not mm -hmm. always be the case which is when the platform needs to come in With and protection. take a bit of responsibility exactly for their users because you know i think if there's responsibility from both angles that's the best way to tackle yeah. it they're basically just protecting humans from humans, though. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It's like that's at the core of it. What's happening here? Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's very, it's really interesting. What are your guys' thoughts on the political parties using platforms like TikTok and the content that they're posting at the minute? I'm kind of surprised it's taken until now for this to happen. I know, mm -hmm. obviously, social media popularity has grown a lot over the past few years, but I would have expected them to do it earlier, particularly to target those younger audiences. Um, I think it's a good way, you know, to try and get young people involved in politics, but in the same breath, obviously the way that it's being executed at the moment, as you say, might not necessarily be providing the most valuable information. Mm -hmm. It's more just a, a race to entertain at the moment. Whereas when these features are being brought in, at least that means that there's yeah. valuable details and information to accompany this content, which people can use to make their informed decisions. What do you think, Max? Mm -hmm. You yeah. could be really honest. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I feel like I, I'm not actually that up to date with the okay. political parties on TikTok at the moment. I haven't seen too much of what they're mm -hmm. doing. Um, Did you see the Scylla Black? I didn't know. Okay. Well, I <laughs> think, happened? yeah, so they, they, it was like, surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I saw that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think it was, it was the Labour Party. I think so. have, have gone quite, like, intense on some of it. But really mm. what a lot of the parties started doing and are maybe kind of pulling back on a little bit because of a little bit of backlash that they got um, was they were just dissing the other parties basically. Like they yeah. weren't really using the platform to educate people on what they would like to implement or anything. They were just shitting on each other basically. Mm. Yeah, is it just pure like entertainment then? It's, like, it's like memes. Meme after meme essentially. Yeah. <laughs> Targeting the other party. It's like you say, a lot of back and forth, which clearly it's drawn attention. So they've achieved something out of that. But I whether mean, that, you know, is quite right, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess they know how to use the platform. Like then. from a they marketing use... perspective, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, from exactly. a moral perspective, mm. questionable maybe. Yeah. But what we have seen is like, um, I think from a strategic perspective, a lot of them have been going like meme, meme, educational, educational, mm -hmm. meme, Slide one educational. In there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, have we got a full funnel approach going on? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's a really interesting topic. And I think it's good that it's obviously good that TikTok are bringing protection elements onto the platform. Yeah, I think all the platforms have a responsibility to do that with the amount of people they're reaching. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah um cool okay well that's all our updates for the week have you guys seen anything going on in social or what have you been focusing on this week i didn't tell you i was gonna ask you this as well <laughs> <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> surprise surprise um what have you been looking into just like trends wise or yeah just anything like what did you talk about in your weekly meeting with the organic team well we did more of a, a campaign focus this week mm -hmm. so rather than doing the usual trends and updates and mm -hmm. then pop culture review we all did a mini presentation on a campaign that we've seen that we really like um funnily enough the general election was one of the ones that came up or jenny mm -hmm. luck as it's being called um a lot of the abbreviations flying around um but that was really interesting because we were kind of talking about different approaches that brands take to their campaigns. Um, for example, I looked into uh, Duolingo and their campaign with Duolipa, where mm. they were trying to do this sort of collaboration that's not a collaboration, uh, which is really ongoing. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's good fun. I think there were lots of different angles that people brought in a lot more humor based, others that are more educational, like from charities and things like that. Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a different meeting from us this week, but it's quite nice to see the different brands that the team brought. Everyone had a different angle to take on what their favorite was. 
Nice, nice. What's happening in paid? Um, in paid, we're looking a lot at testing at the mm-hmm. moment. There's a couple of new features that have come out. So one of the main one is for ASE, so advanced shopping campaigns. Mm-hmm. They've introduced different objectives away from like purchase objectives. Mm-hmm. So for lead gen activity, you can do complete registration. Um, so that's something I personally start testing and it's performed really well at the moment for one of my clients. So yeah, almost like double the signups we were getting for our original campaigns. So it just goes to show at the moment that like that um, advantage plus like targeting, the AI targeting, mm-hmm. um, is working really well and i think the discussion for us in paid is like because that time gets taken away from specific targeting and working on audiences where do we put that time and how do we um make sure we're above competitors yeah and i think a lot of it's around creative now like we need to really hone in on our creative and make sure that's yeah better than our competitors and really engaging because basically meta is choosing who we're going to yeah yeah, I think we've been doing quite a lot of work actually. And um, Vera, you'll have to bleep this out, but I'll show you guys afterwards the work that we did for. Yeah. It's all about like crazy, disruptive, paid creative, which obviously isn't yeah. going to work for every single brand, but it's stuff that's like makes you think whenever you see it as a paid ad. Yeah. Um, and I think that's what we kind of need to be getting into to now a lot more. Um. It's reporting week as well. It's reporting time, which is always fun. (laughs) Um, So for those that don't know, listening, we always get our reports to our clients seven days within the month after the month end, basically. Yeah. Um, So do we like reporting weeks? Probably not. (laughs) (laughs) Honest honest answer. Yeah, honest answer. Um, It's not my favorite week of the month, (laughs) that's for sure. It's um, also quarterly and monthly at the moment, so it's, it's busy times, isn't it? Is. it? Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. guys work on a shared client together, sort of a large yeah. client that's full service within the agency. So mm-hmm. there's quite a lot to to do there and kind of pulling together the data from the paid campaigns with the organic campaigns, trying to yeah. see what's correlating. There's mm-hmm. a lot to do. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I do find it interesting that like it is useful to to see how things have performed and drawing out themes, particularly when it comes to quarterly. I do quite like the quarterly. Monthly obviously is quite it's the same format whereas looking at the last few months as a whole is really interesting because you can draw more overarching themes Mm -hmm. along the content which we can then take forwards when planning our next quarter's content i think particularly for organic as well because there's only so much content you can and should be posting that you almost you need almost more data if you're like trying like an ownable series or something Mm -hmm. like that to be able to go okay well we've posted this six times now here are the optimizations that we've made every single time yeah should we continue with this or should we swap over something else it's it's all it's quite hard actually Mm -hmm. for organic to do much more than kind of um like what traffic have we driven through what impact have we had on brand search volume like it's hard on a monthly basis to do that Mm -hmm. and also one thing we've been really trying to do with clients is like what are the most valuable things for you to see on a monthly basis so that we can make actions off the back of those as quickly as physically possible because there's no point doing like a 60 page reporting deck every single month because it's good you're not going to get it until the third week of the month and it's too late to make any of those insights anyway um so like what do you guys think and again I didn't warn you about this it's just come to my head but what do you think is the most valuable um metrics for brands to look at on a monthly basis when it comes to paid and organic social i think organic wise i mean the key ones that we will always look at are reach um and then engagement or engagement rate uh are pretty standard but uh, it depends what you're trying to achieve with the post i know now we're implementing new planning frameworks where we pair uh, a plan post with a metric because ultimately the way we create or curate content rather will be different for something that's aiming for reach versus engagement. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to attribute different metrics to different posts when it comes to reporting. Mm -hmm. So I think those would be the key ones when it comes to TikTok, perhaps completion rate would come into it as well. Um, But the key ones, yeah, I would say reach and engagement. Nice. What about you? Yeah, I think, again, it depends on the goals of the client. But when we're looking at paid, obviously, you have that investment in paid. So key things we want to look at is ROAS. We want to look at revenue as well, conversion rate, if we're looking at more of like a conversion focused campaign, Mm -hmm. which quite often a lot of our clients are. Um, 
click-through rate as well is a really important one obviously when we're looking at creative and how we can improve our creative down the line that's a key one we mm -hmm. want to be looking at because that's where a lot of our testing efforts will go into is improving the click-through rate obviously yeah nice that makes sense and then I think the other thing to add on is like that more holistic view of things so you know for page you might want to look at your last click row ask through yeah. GA or any other sort of reporting platform that you have and then also making sure that you're adding in any insight into search volumes across search platforms that you can get so whether that's google trends data um anything of that nature and just also looking at the sessions that you've driven through organic as well i think that's really important because if you can align peaks and specific um landing page views for example to yeah. posts that you've had mm -hmm. particularly if we're talking about viral content on tiktok yeah. i think that's super important to mm -hmm. look at as well definitely we did actually find because in i think it's the, for the quarterly we looked at organic utms and we're able to actually we, i think like a fair amount of money to purely organic utms um just through that content which is really nice i think it's quite hard in organic sales wise obviously working on a fashion brand one of the things that they want to drive is sales uh, so organically, it could be quite hard to show that, but it's quite nice to use, like, for example, our UTMs that we've mm -hmm. placed into our content and to see that people have followed to those pages and that's helped to drive a sale in that sense. A hundred percent. And I think with the likes of social commerce becoming so much bigger, I think we are going to see a little bit of a shift towards how we can report organically mm -hmm. and also social commerce helps paid from an attribution perspective because they don't have to leave the platform. So we have access to all of that data too. So it's an exciting time. <laughs> um, one final topic, because I've kept you here for ages and we're going to end up rolling over. Um, <laughs> was, so you guys, how long have you guys been in the industry for now? I think a year and eight months. I nice. Think. I think I would be a year and three months. Okay. Yeah. So we're a year in. Yeah. And what I wanted to ask you guys was what are kind of the straight down the line differences that you would see of people that work in paid and people that work in organic social? What's the differences between you two? And I think if you talk about organic social, what do you think is different to the type of person that works in organic social to the type of person that works in paid? And then you can flip. Um... I feel like there's a bit more creativity in organic. Um, obviously, you've got to think about things like captions, actually thinking about uh, creative. And I think with organic, it's more storytelling than mm -hmm. it is with page when you're looking at things like creative. So uh, page is like very promotional, so it's product focused. Whereas, yeah, organic is a bit more like storytelling. So I feel like you need to be quite a creative person to mm -hmm. work in organic. Also reactive as well. I feel like you have to be quite quick thinking because if something comes out and you want to react to react to that quickly or like reply to a comment or like reply to another brand if that's what you're doing, I think, yeah, you have to be quite quick and witty as well. A lot of the organic people I feel in the company are quite witty. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Rihanna, yeah, I see that. <laughs> um, I think, so if I were to say for paid, probably obviously there is data driven motives and organic but like it's so numbers based and you guys are constantly checking back like how stuff's performing you're adjusting your you know like if you want to change your targeting like you're constantly going and looking at the numbers to inform how you're going to change your strategy on like a daily basis so I feel like it's very very numbers based whereas organic is a lot more like there's that creative side and as much as we use data to inform what we do it's very it's more like you say the kind of like coming up with an idea kind of thing, whereas paid you're really getting into the results and the data of it, if that makes sense. So good with numbers, I would say. <laughs> I would numbers. probably go with for paid, definitely. Yeah, nice. It's like, um, have you seen on TikTok where people do like when the nails marketing person goes past the, <laughs> like, the graph the, yeah, yeah, the oh, person? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah that. that's what it is. Um, <laughs> So yeah, final, final question for me is, um, so obviously, Rihanna, you're almost a year and a half in, you're almost two years into your career. Are there any other departments that you would be like, ooh, I could see myself trying out that, or are you like, no, I live and breathe paid media, for example? I really enjoy paid personally. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I really enjoy it, but if there's... If there was anywhere I would look into, maybe be on like the strategy mm -hmm. side of things. Because when I'm looking at like bigger picture stuff 
for paid and planning campaigns and planning budgets and stuff i do enjoy that bigger picture side of things so if there was anywhere i'd probably say strategy nice rihanna I'm very much the same. I love it on organic. It feels very me. But again, if I were to hypothetically go for one, I do think uh, being in content would be interesting. Obviously, that goes very hand in hand with organic. Yeah. But like I, in my spare time, like, I used to really be into kind of like videography and editing and that sort of thing. So maybe to get more hands on with that end of the department, I'd find interesting to have a go at. But yeah, I love organic. Go girl, 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 I am, but... <laughs> 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 nice, cool. Well, look, thank you so much for joining and um, happy first podcast. Thanks, yeah, thanks for thanks having for us. Having it's us. been great. <laughs> and thanks for everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, do everything. It makes us really happy. Um, and we will see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>